welcome everybody. My name is Bill Fraser. I'm the city manager here in Montpelier. And I'm joined today by Police Chief Brian Pete and Community Justice Center Director Carol Plant and Social Worker Susan Lamary, right? Is that right? Lamere. Lamere. Okay, sorry. Uh, and Assistant City Manager Cameron Niedermeyer is here as well. Um, and um, some of you. So, uh, oh, and Aaron Anderson is here from our Community Justice Center as well. Great. Uh, so our goals today, we had three topics we wanted to give people the opportunity to talk about. Um, the first thing was just to talk about what did or didn't happen recently at the State House. We all know uh, we've had, we had word that there might be some bad dealings and fortunately none of that happened, but I think it still was concerning to people that uh, we could have been a target of that kind of um, sort of activity. Secondly, is to talk about resiliency in the community, the kind of resources people can have uh, as they reach out uh, and deal with some of the stressful situations we have. And then finally, to talk about processes and healing, how we as a community can learn, you know, learn or improve our conversations with one another. And we'll wrap up. We've set a maximum of an hour and a half for this conversation. And obviously, we don't need to use it all if not nece if necessary but we certainly want, don't want to cut people short. I'll just start by saying it's been a very stressful year for all of us. Uh, it's, uh, you know, coming out in March, we were all shut down uh, for COVID and have seen our lives change drastically. The way we do business, the way we work, the way we interact with ourselves, our families, our friends, and, uh, had, you know, the way government works, the way businesses work. So that in and of itself has been stressful. And then on the national scene, there's been a lot of uh, stress and some really horrible things we've seen um, come out uh, over the summer and fall. Uh, there are some very racist activities, uh, are very uh, nasty interactions. We saw some activities happen in, here in Montpelier with uh, sort of more anger than we've seen in the past. And uh, then coming into this winter, of course, we had a, a, an election that's uh, spawned very high feelings, including uh, then the lingering post feelings when it appeared at least some people weren't going to accept the results of the election. And that culminated with um, the shocking events of January 6th, where we saw people actually attacking the United States Capitol, seeking to overturn a US election, something I think most of us never thought we would see. That led to uh, the word that state capitals and the US Capitol were going to be uh, descended upon with armed folks on January 17th and or January 20th, Inauguration Day or some <coughs> in between, uh, any time in between. Uh, and that, was, that information was spread around the country. So as a result, uh, those of us in Montpelier uh, and state government prepared for the worst at our state house. And it led to the unsettling sight of, of um, our state police officers walking around in kind of military style garb. It's not something we're used to seeing here in Montpelier. It's not something that most of us want to see in our peaceful small town. Um, and as I said, fortunately, um, we didn't have that kind of altercation. Most capitals did not. And we hope that that has passed, but you know, we can't be sure whether something might come in the future. So again, today's an opportunity to answer questions, discuss what did and didn't happen, what kind of preparations, what kind of communications, what people liked and didn't like, and to answer whatever questions we can, to talk about what resources might be available for people who are feeling, feeling overwhelmed or stressed by all that's going on and to talk about how we can process and heal as community members with through these uh, tense times. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian Pete for the first section to talk specifically about the events on um, over in January at the State House. For those who have not met Police Chief Brian Pete, he started with us on July 1st and brings a wealth of knowledge from various places around the country. We've been very fortunate to have him and is very committed to community outreach and uh, these types of events. 
So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Chief Pete. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone. Um, it's uh, in echoing what um, our city manager said that it, it was um, it was a very high stressful situation, I think for all of us. And, um, and from what I've learned about being here in Montpelier that we, we pride ourselves in the ability to, to be able to, to express our opinions and, and, and to, uh, to discuss things freely. So this, was a, this was particularly you know, a difficult situation, I think, and very stressful for everyone, as evidenced by folks uh, calling into us, emailing us, um, stopping us, coming by the station and, 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 and telling us about their anxiety. So um, we're here for service for the community. Um, so I just want to make sure that um, the folks know that our department um, is committed to that. One of the other concerns, rightfully even one for my, you know, my own, is, is, is law enforcement and how law enforcement makes sure that it stays impartial, that, um, that, and that we enforce the laws, and especially people's rights for assembly and free speech uh, and moving forward and protect them through that as best as we possibly can. Um, so uh, like, like many other people, I was disturbed and bothered by, the, um, uh, by any investigations or allegations that law enforcement members were involved in any of the insurrection events that happened at the state capitol. And, uh, and, I, will, and I can tell you um, as the public that no members of the Montpelier Police Department were there and we're not aware of, 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 of any involvement in that with our, with our officers. And we also have standing policies uh, in place, duties to intervene and to, uh, to report uh, things that we see um, that are not uh, conducive to what our values are and to what our profession needs to be. Um, so, but uh, again, what, what happened was uh, a, a a uh, few weeks back is the FBI released information saying that there was um, there were reports online of groups of individuals that were calling for armed events at all the state capitals throughout the United States. Um, of course, Montpelier was also specifically listed in there. So we co coordinated with the Vermont State Police, with the Capitol Police, with the uh, Judicial Security, Building Grounds and Services, uh, the FBI, the Sheriff's Department of Washington County, uh, Washington County State's Attorney's Office, and uh, just a, a whole horse, uh, host of other agencies to try to figure out or to, to work on an operations plan that will provide safety and security for not only the State House Capitol Complex, but for uh, downtown Montpelier, and especially for the neighborhoods in the area. Um, so we were, um, again, working on that ops planning, uh, and, uh, and, and that planning, again, involved uh, looking at uh, statewide resources, uh, asking other agencies if they could uh, assist us uh, with, with manpower. So would, that's, that's probably, that, that's the reason why uh, folks may have seen um, marked units from places like Newport or Shelburne or even Burlington. And, and, uh, and, and very good kudos to them because they understood what, what our community was feeling. Uh, and again, with Burlington, with, with the manning issues that they're dealing with, they were able to send four officers, uh, two on each day on the 17th and on the 20th to come down to help us. So, um, so our officers were, were very familiar with what it is we needed to do. They understood the unique relationship that Montpelier Police Department has with its community, that we're extremely service oriented. And, and I believe um, that the interactions that they've had with folks that are out there in the community uh, uh, should be a reflection on that. Um, but we, we had no specific information of, of targeted threats to elected or appointed officials um, to the, the Capitol itself. But again, because of the, what we had saw in the nation's Capitol and because of the information reported to us about what was being said in these social, uh, social media areas, we took this, we took this uh, potential threat extremely seriously, so, which is why we had a more uh, aggressive appearance um, in, in, on the 17th and on the 20th. Um, so uh, uh, fortunately, um, on the 17th and on the 20th, there were no incidences of significance to report. There were no arrests, no citations that were given throughout that time. Uh, but going forward, what does that mean? Um, well, we're trying to figure that out as well. And, and we're still seeing 
and still being told about uh, folks who are online who are still, as, as Bill Frazier had mentioned, still upset with the outcome of the election and, and looking, at, uh, looking at ways to, to voice their opinions and their concerns. But then there are also some fringe element groups that are still uh, making some, some, some unspecified threats. So going forward, uh, the Montpelier Police Department will make sure that we continue to uh, work with our partners uh, and, and, and get this information uh, that we may need and get the information, especially out to the community, to the community, members of the community, so that everyone knows what we're doing at all times. We don't believe in trying to hoard information because we're servants and we're guardians of the community. So we want to make sure that we have a very strong relationship with uh, our community members, with our organizational groups, and, and only together uh, can, we, can we stop something before it potentially happens. And I again, want to add to that, that we don't have any specific or credible threats to the city, to the Capitol, or to any officials uh, then. We don't have them at this time, but we still want to make sure we have our due diligence and uh, maintaining the safety and security for our city. Thanks, Brian. If I may, I meant to mention this before you started, but a couple of housekeeping. I think most people are getting Zoom savvy these days, but if you could keep your uh, mute on if when you're not speaking. If you'd like to ask a question or speak, I think most people know now you go to the little reactions and there's a raise your hand and you'll see the little hand popped up on mine. And uh, Cameron Niedermeyer will keep track of those and keep an, an order so that we can call on people. And, um, and out, lastly, I would ask that we keep the dialogue here um, amongst us, not uh, a side, con side conversations in the chat. I've been in some meetings where there's two or three meetings going on and people debating a point in chat. So the point here is to have a forum. Let's, let's think of this as if we were in um, an open room having this conversation and not having the, the chat uh, function going on. So th those are my three requests. Having said that, the chief obviously offered some remarks. We're happy to uh, listen to any comments or answer any questions that people might have. Okay, then. Going once. Mr. Stone. And Cameron, will you keep, can you do this part? Thanks. Hi, I'm Jacob Stone. I've lived in Montpelier for about six years, and I've been a volunteer at the Community Justice Center for that same period of time. Uh, a question for uh, Chief Pete. First of all, I want to say I really appreciate the way you handled that situation uh, on Inauguration Day. Um, I was glad to see things stay calm. A, a, a question, though. The folks who may have been threatening the, the violence, do we know who they are? Are we in contact with them, or are they some enigmatic group that we only know on the internet? What sort of contact might we have with them? That That's a very good question, sir, and, uh, and thank you very much. Um, for the opportunity to answer it. Um, so we, again, I believe in maximum information, minimal delay as best as possible. Uh, before I answer that, I, I just want to, before I forgot, to say that within the next day or so, the Montpelier Police Department is going to uh, put out there an after action report. In that after action report, it'll specify some of the things that we've done um, for the planning, as well as what we plan to do going forward. So again, we wanna make sure that we that, that our community knows what we're doing and it's gonna recognize the strengths and some of the challenges that we had in planning for these events on the 17th and the 20th. Uh, so specifically for the answer to your question, we were looking at national trends and national threats. So there were some states that had more specific or uh, specified threats than others. Again, Montpelier did not see that. However, um, we, we were looking for anything that was specific to the state itself. So um, as we're working with federal partners and with the Vermont Intelligence Center, which is uh, run by the Vermont State Police, we're looking for nexuses that are related to the state or anything that may come into the state for those specific issues. So we don't have specified or specified people um, that, that have made any threats to the state of Vermont, but we wanna make sure that we're not trampling on folks' rights to have whatever dialogues or whatever opinions that they may have, just so long as they don't 
become into a gray area that it's that it's potentially dangerous to our capital, uh, to our community, and 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 to our elected and appointed officials. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. We had Barbara Burnett. Yeah, I could. I couldn't. Hear, I couldn't hear. Okay. Um, first up, I, I would like to thank the police and everyone for the the great job you did in getting information out to the community by Facebook, by the Front Porch Forum, which is best. Um, and I think you got you. It was really something. It's something I could print out and get put in my apartment building because there's a lot of people that don't have computer access and they didn't know what was going on. Um, so I really appreciate that, and uh, I know that there have been a couple of rallies in the past from some people that were definitely supporting the ex-president earlier while he was still the president, and that that those kind of got a little mm, rowdy. <laughs> And uh, so I think those are the things that the rest of us that I was concerned about in particular, because um, I take this quite seriously, especially what happened at the Capitol on the 6th. And uh, I appreciate your taking it with that seriousness as well. Thank you. All right, Chief, you have a question in the chat. Um, the, Tom stated the MPT, ooh, words, MPD doesn't have uh, resources to spend time monitoring the internet or social media. What support does the state or federal government provide on these topics? Yes, ma'am. Um, so basically, yeah, that is true. We, we don't necessarily have the resources to spend a lot of time, which is one of the reasons why we, we want to make sure that we rebuild the trust within our community for See Something, Say Something campaign. Um, we are aware that uh, ever since, as we've all been going through this within our, within our community, that we've received a significant amount, or the state police and the FBI have received a significant amount of more tips from the community that they're working to piece together right now. So I'm extraordinarily grateful. We're extraordinarily grateful as a department um, uh, for that. Um, but the support that we do get is is with the Vermont Intelligence Center and with the FBI and, and, and other areas, specifically the Joint Terrorism Task Force, which is a group of FBI agents, other federal agencies, and some local regional law enforcement partners who are working together on like uh, domestic violence groups, militia, um, violent extremist groups, to those effects. And they're, they're, they're doing their best to monitor those situations. Um, we have one officer who's been assigned to the state's uh, narcotics, uh, uh, joint regional task force team. He has uh, specific information or nexus to the state, as well as the relationship that we have with the Vermont Intelligence Center and the FBI and the JTTF. And then we also have another officer uh, who is assigned uh, and part of a federal task force with the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation. So we have many different avenues and ways and, and very tight relation, working relationships and friendships with intelligence partners that if they see something, they're definitely gonna let us know. And in turn, we're gonna make sure we communicate those concerns or those issues up through our chain of command, all the way up to the city council, as well as share that with the general public. So Chief uh, got talking there, got excited. Um, JTTF is the Joint Terrorism Task Force that's run by the FBI, just in case anyone wondered. Um, we had another beginning of a question. Um, Josh, and Delise, Dallas, I'm sorry. Um, you have a question if you want to just speak up. It just begins as a concern. To, oh, okay. I think, um, Chief, they would like you to talk about the incident between um, the, or anyway, they're saying they want to know why no charges were filed against adults pushing young man I'm not sure it's okay they're having bad service so I'm sorry that sounds a little piecemeal because I'm trying to read something piecemeal so they might be asking about the incident at the state house um, a couple weeks ago if you don't mind speaking on that yes ma'am so in, in early December there was an incident where there were um, some folks who were who had uh, gathered at the state house um, in support of the former president um, 
then there was an involvement with uh, uh, some other folks, some some young young people who had come uh, to the State House Brown. What we did was uh, we were not on scene when the incident occurred. Uh, when when the calls came in, we came in, asked folks uh, they needed medical assistance, medical help, and then we tried our best to ascertain what happened. And we're impartial when we when we do this. Um, so we gathered the information uh, based on. Uh, witnesses based on uh, what folks had told us at the time, uh, brought it together and then handed it over to, uh, to the state's attorney's office. Uh, at that particular point in time, we, the Montpelier Police Department does not approve charges to arrest anyone. In this particular case, we conducted the investigation, turned the information over to the state's attorney's office. And, and, and with, mo with most cases like this, there was, um, there, there's a restorative justice element that we, that we try to work through um, for these types of situations. So uh, it was, it, it's, this is a case that's, that's at the state attorney level at this particular point in time and not with the Montpelier Police Department. And when Carol Plant uh, comes to her turn, she'd be, I'm sure she'd be happy to explain how the restorative justice system works. And I believe uh, if they are not, they will be the documents and affidavits related to that case will be posted so people can read the various statements. I see a Meredith Warner with a hand up and then Mary Mullaney. Yes, thank you. Um, just a follow up, um, Chief Pete, on what happened in early December. Um, there were just definitely some discrepancies between the statements that were in the VT Digger article that I'm sure you read and um, the police report that we saw, uh, particularly around um, police uh, being or not being there. And I think a lot of concerns from the public that if police were there, that um, support wasn't provided to the young person who was being kind of surrounded by these folks. And I'd, I'd love for you to speak a little bit to those discrepancies, because I think they've been really um, unsettling for a lot of folks in the community. Definitely. So I, I believe that in my conversation with the VT Digger, that a majority of the things that I said were taken out to a different context. I don't know why I can't respond to any, any how it happened, but I can tell you that it did happen. What I was trying to explain to the VT Digger regarding what our policies are when we're at the state house and folks are um, exercising their, their, their rights of free speech and assembly, that we try to take a standoff approach, how we got bumped up to something that, that uh, the Montpelier Police Department stood by and watched this. I don't know how that happened, um, but uh, it did and it was printed out to that way. So but all I can tell you is that we were not on scene when that incident unfolded. We were called to that scene when officers came to the scene, they did their best to, to make sure folks were separated. But I think at that particular point in time, um, they were separated. There were some skirmishes that had popped up uh, afterwards in our presence. We mitigated those, tried to keep fo folks separate as we were trying to ascertain what exactly happened. Mary? I think Meredith um, raised the question and that, that I was going to ask. I, I noticed um, the discrepancy in the accounts of police being there, not being there and whatever, but um, I just, I find myself having a strong reaction to that incident in that it, it did involve adults um, and the person that was, she wasn't injured but um, it, it was a 15 year old girl. And I, um, I have difficulty with the fact that to me, the, the adults need to be held to a higher standard mm -hmm. um, anyway. But I think, I think um, the question has been addressed. So thank you. Carol, do you mind making note of that and sort of circle back to address that when we um, start talking about the restorative process? Thank you. Um, I didn't know, Bill, if you wanted to intersperse that or have a response. Well, I, I just would say again that if 
if it's not already all the sort of affidavits and documents and statements from different people involved are, are or will be posted so that Barry or others are welcome to read through all of it. I think there's a lot of conflicting versions and I'm sure everyone feels that what they believe is correct and I get that because it, it can be confusing. But I if you read it and put yourself in the position of someone trying to investigate that, you might find that it's, you know, not having been on the scene to witness it themselves. Uh, it's a it's a difficult situation, but certainly in general, yes, by all means, if adults are attacking a young person, they should certainly be held to a higher standard. I don't think there's any any question about that. Um, there's a long sort of question in the chat. From Tim Favorite. Tim, do you want to pose that question or would you like it read? Um, I can read it if, if that's helpful. Yep. Um, yeah, so first of all, I, I appreciate all of you holding this discussion. This is uh, good to hear. Um, I'm glad to hear, hear that no officers were involved in the Capitol insurrection a few weeks ago. Um, but if that hadn't been the case, or if somebody uh, in the department were involved in a situation that might be at odds the department's commitment to neutrality, uh, what kind of kind of consequences would they have faced if you're at liberty to say? Well, um, so I'll, I'll preference that with, um, again, when, when I first come, I came to Montpelier, um, I, I quickly learned of the culture of this department. And I think that's, that's a testament to, um, to our style of government, to our elected officials, to our city manager, um, and, and especially to our department and its supervision that we are geared towards community service and we're geared towards transparency and we're geared towards doing our best to earn the trust of, of, of our community. Um, th that being said, it, it's, so, so there, there are several different administrative things that, are, uh, that would have to be addressed for, for ones. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an administrative policy that if folks are gonna go outside of the state, they need to, to let us know and then that you know so we can we can track that especially due to COVID-19 concerns. Um, uh, Assistant City Manager Anita Meyer may be able to to expound upon that one as well but one of the things that we look at um, for our department is is just is, is the ability to do your job and and what your understanding of your obligations are of what your, your understanding of your oath is and our job is not to, uh, to, to make law. Our job is, to, is to, to do what our responsibilities are to make sure that we protect our folks as best as we can and that our allegiance is to the constitution and to the state laws of Vermont. So we, th that would be something that would not be tolerated uh, within the Montpelier Police Department. Um, but at the same time, I also do wanna make sure that I pay homage to the uh, the men and women of the department because uh, I honestly think that that's something that they themselves would not tolerate either. Thank you. I also note that um, it's been in the chat for those who can get it, the link to the information about the, uh, the December incident um, has been posted. And, and sir, if I may, we, we did uh, put in the service rec ticket request because we're going to do some additional redactions to that. So it has since been taken down. So the only thing that's on there right now is the footage. And we're in the process of working again on those redactions and then uh, reposting. Thanks. I spoke too soon. Uh, oh, any other questions in this portion about uh, Obviously, we're talking a little bit about the December incident, the January incidents, um, any, any of this part. Really appreciate people's questions and concerns. So if it would help, um, I, I could share a little bit about, um, about State's Attorney Tebow's response to us with regard to the referral to the Justice Center. Um, that might be helpful for some people to understand. Um, sure. Some of his thinking around that. Yep. Why don't you do that? Can you just hold yes. on? We have a hand from Meredith Warner. Sure. sure. Thanks for allowing me to add a little more to my first question. It's a little bit, a little bit harder to thread. Um, I'm kind of thinking about the, 
the incident that happened at our state house on the 5th where we had pro-Trump supporters, and I did read the report before it was taken down to be redacted, using a lot of language about um, this young person being a BLMer, um, referring to Black Lives Matter, using a lot of language of her being, in the video she's called an operative, a lot of language that I think we saw really commonly used among the same kinds of people who then a month later were at the nation's capital. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's also become really clear in the kind of public and national narrative that so many of those folks that stormed the Capitol uh, in Washington on the 6th uh, are affiliated with, with white nationalist groups. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just, I'd love to hear a little bit about what do we know uh, and how, what do we know about what's going on with white nationalism here in, in central Vermont and Montpelier? Um, what is the relationship of that group to the Trump supporters and the way that they spoke about this young person, uh, the language they use? I'm just, I, I'm, you know, I draw connections be, between these two events uh, and I'd love to hear from uh, the chief about uh, any of that that he's noticed uh, and speak to that if he would. Just, yes, thank you. Um, and before we hand that over to Chief, I'd just like to offer a comment on that too. You know, I've heard some of this. I read that in those reports and there was an event, I think in the fall, uh, people had organized for a Blue Lives Matter or, you know, pro-police event, again, not involving us, uh, and a group of counterparts to show up. And I, I stood in front of some of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life, some of the language being used and and racist language and it was it was horrible it was, and, and I couldn't imagine it happening here in Montpelier uh, so I, I certainly understand your feelings Meredith and one of the challenges I know for our police department and for us as a government is how do we protect the rights of all to express their opinions and safely and to deal with the potential threats from folks who might seek to be injurious uh, to either a small group of people or to our government institutions to, or to any of us. So um, your, your fear and concern uh, is not alone. And I, I specifically want to say it for myself because I'm not a police officer, I'm a civilian too. I have, you know, I raised a family in this community and um, it's scary what we're seeing and hearing. So I, I appreciate your feelings, but um, specifically to the question about what we're seeing about white nationalism and links, Chief, could you address that? Yes, sir. So w with that, it, again, w w we have partners that are um, that are working on just trying to trying to keep an eye on on any potential concerns or issues that may be within the state or that may, they may be uh, drawn to the state. One of the biggest concerns that I personally have are, uh, again, when 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 folks are gathering to express their, their their Second Amendment rights and their rights to free assembly and speech, what type of element that brings out. And, and that's one of the things that keeps me up at night, <laughs> every night, because this is a place that everyone comes to talk about their opinions and talk about how they feel and, and talk about what they want um, in their government and what they want, how they wanted the, their government to represent them. So, so that, is, that is a concern of ours, um, is just to do everything that we can to work with all the partners that we can to, to ensure the safety uh, of our community. Um, as these things go forward. I don't know if I could speak to any connections between white nationalism and folks of one political spectrum or not, uh, but uh, my hope is that um, as we move forward that we work on, on that healing part, that, um, that folks, all of us realize that the words and the, the labels and, and the categories that we use um, can sometimes be be divisive and not help a situation. So my hope is that that we all figure out different ways that we can can we can speak to one another, and that we can work through the issues that we have. So before we go to Carol uh, to talk, so I, I, we've been about a half an hour on this, and we do have two other sections we wanted to get to, but I don't want to uh, leave this off. There is a, a post from Olivia's iPhone. Um, I think she's the mom of the girl that was involved. Olivia, would you like to speak? Or would you like me to read your comments? Yeah, hi. hi, hi, hi. Um, oh, sorry. Sure. Sorry about that. 
Um, I just, if I, if I could get a little clarity around, um, so my daughter was, was the child that was at the state house um, and went to counter protest as everyone is aware and knows about. But the part that's very um, um, unclear is um, my daughter was surrounded by the protesters and, um, and pushed and all that is true. And she tried to call the police um, and her phone was taken from her by the by the um, the Trump supporters, and then it was retrieved again. And when she called the police, she was told, and this is when she's still surrounded by <clears throat> the Trump supporters. She was told that there was officers on the scene. Now that may mean that they were on their way, but she was told that they were there, and that's why we, I'm also concerned about this. Were they uh, still observing? Or, were there, or did she notice that maybe it was the uh, security guards that maybe were at the state house? But she definitely saw uh, people in uniform on the outskirts. And perhaps it was, um, like I said, security and maybe the police were on their way. But um, it's a little um, unsure. Maybe you can't talk about that. I don't know. But I just wanted to throw that out there. And thank you. No, thank you, ma'am. And, and that's, that's a very fair question. And first and fo foremost, I can... I want to let you know that as a parent, I, I share your concern. Um, I, I just as a human being, I share your concern. And yeah, I, I'm 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 disturbed by by how that all went down. Um, so it it, it kind of discourages me of, of the direction where I think that we're all going. And I want to do our best to bring that to take that away and and bring back some more positivity into what's going on. But um, I, I, from what, what our officers responded to the scene, when they got to the scene, they had noticed, they, as they had indicated in the reporting, that, they, that the groups were had, had already been separated. So I don't know if there were BGS security folks who were there. I don't know if, if Capitol Police officers were there on, on scene. I don't know, but I know that when Montpelier Police Department showed up, that the incident had already they, the, both groups have been separated, and when it tried, when it almost sparked back up again, officers intervened, and then they, because they, some of the officers had left the scene, and then the supervisors called them back to to try to again to continue to work on de-escalation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. So, um, unless there's anybody else, I'd like to wrap up this section. Carol, could you perhaps give us a brief? summary of um, the state's attorney's recommendation and very quickly about restorative practice. And then I think we'd like to move into the resiliency section uh, with Susan and talking about resources that are available for people if they are feeling stress about these types of situations. Thanks, Bill. Um, so, so when we got the referral um, from the state's attorney, um, he wanted to be clear about and responded to someone's request about why the case um, was referred to restorative justice. And his, his thinking is that um, he really wants cases to be resolved at the lowest level of disposition. And in this case, he, he makes those decisions based on, you know, he, first he looks at, at uh, the available evidence. And so he does an assessment of the evidence and he, he indicated to us that, you know, where sometimes where the, the evidence is ambiguous or might be contradictory, it makes it, it makes it more difficult to, to, you know, make a, a clear case for prosecuting something. But in his mind, again, under the circumstances, he felt like this really was a good uh, opportunity for for the participants to uh, use a restorative process. And in our restorative process, the focus really is on uh, gaining a better understanding of the harm. Um, so, so this would be an opportunity to talk about, you know, from, from different perspectives, the person who is responsible as well as the person who's been impacted, you know, what how they were affected by what happened. And the benefit to that is that each person comes away with a clear understanding of how their actions and decisions might have affected or, um, or contributed to the situation that happened. So, so, you know, generally that's the philosophy of our state's attorney. 
Um, and he also indicated that, you know, there are other events that happened at the State House. One was um, around the Poor People's Campaign. Um, he also indicated that some uh, climate justice events that happened where there might have been some escalation or some other um, civil disobedience. You know, his, his, he wants to send the cases in, that, in the direction of restorative justice because, again, the benefit of people having, developing a greater understanding of how their decisions and actions affect others. So that was basically his reasoning for sending it to restorative justice. Uh, and I will say that, you know, in situations like this where there are these deep-seated and uh, opinions about, um, you know, one political party or the other, um, and, you know, it's no secret, I think, to all of us that these divisions have been deepened over the last four years and have been really fomented by the, the past president. Um, so, you know, when we're in a situation like that and it's very emotional also, it makes it hard for us to listen to each other and it makes it hard for us to be accepting and want to try to understand the perspective of the other person or the other side. So, you know, it's a, that was an incredibly adversarial situation. And um, in this case, being able to bring it to a place where there are you know, in a restorative process, we're going to be neutral in that process, and we're going to really encourage that deeper understanding, learning from each other is really the, you know, the best option for first taking responsibility and also making th things right where things need to be repaired. So that's basically, that's basically what he shared with us. Carol, we had a question in the chat whether CJC was for violent offenders. Um, well, so that's an, that's an interesting question. So there are certain cases that we don't. And, and if I may, um, sorry, there was just a follow-up to the same chat, which said adults threatening minors is an appropriate time for learning about others' viewpoints. I think it was a question. So is adults threatening minors an appropriate time for learning about others' viewpoints? Um, I I'm, don't really want to give my opinion about that because that would be just mine about it. And again, you know, the referrals are made either directly by um, Montpelier Police Department or other law enforcement agencies, or they come to us from the state's attorney. So we do we have these conversations in the restorative justice world all the time. There are certain cases that we don't deal with, and um, domestic violence, in, in, intimate partner violence sexual violence, uh, those cases we don't see right now. Um, that being said, most of the pre-charge referrals that we get either from the state's attorney or from law enforcement are uh, misdemeanor crimes, nonviolent misdemeanor crimes. We occasionally will see an assault, uh, simple assault crime. Uh, this, these partic this particular incident would have been disorderly conduct charges, which are you know, completely relevant for, for the type of cases that we see. Uh, so, yeah, I hope that answers the, the question. And we just, <laughs> we just, we had a statement in the, in the um, chat just said restorative justice can be very helpful educational experience. When I was a high school principal, I sometimes used it with students in every case. It increased the understanding of the offenders and changed their attitudes. So appreciate those comments. Again, if we can if we could try not to have separate conversations going, I think getting questions posted and answering is good. But um, anyway, thank I, I really appreciate everyone's uh, sort of concern about this, and I'm glad we can address this. Would like to move on briefly, or not necessarily briefly, to Susan and talking about uh, community resources for people who have anxiety and stress, whether it's just over election-related issues or COVID or community angst. Um, I know I have. And I think probably many others have as well. So, um, Susan, could you give talk to us for a little bit? Thank you. Um, I'm looking around the Zoom room, and I see a number of faces of people that I've met and had conversations with, but also some folks that I have not met yet. Um, so, I just wanted to do a very quick introduction. I am an employee of Washington County Mental Health but I work out of the 
police departments in Montpelier as well as Berry City. Um, and my role is evolving, but it ranges from crisis response to follow up after incidents happen, um, either law enforcement asking me to reach out to people that they're concerned about or people who are involved in something asking me to get clarification or give support around something that they went through. Um, so when we were talking about this meeting tonight, um, we talked about discussing resiliency, um, which I think of as bouncing back after a very difficult or traumatic even experience. And as I'm listening to people talk, um, I'm feeling like resiliency may not be at all where we are because with the combination of the pandemic and the recent acts of violence, threats of violence, you know, nationally, locally, I think a lot of people are having very um, legitimate concerns about are we safe? Are our communities safe? Are our kids safe? Um, and so I think a lot of people are having a really challenging time right now. Uh, a number of people that I talk to on a day-to-day -day basis are not people who had any involvement formally with the mental health system ever. They're just going through something. And I think um, a great many of us are going through some things right now. So I think we're still in it in a certain respect. Um, resiliency may be jumping the gun, maybe um, coping and seeking support, um, having the kinds of forums that we're having right now so that we can process some of these really overwhelming sometimes events. Um, when I first logged on, I was in the process of trying to share my number, which is probably still up at the top of chat. And then I wanted to talk a bit about Washington County mental health, a bit about another way. And then I saw Ken here, who's going to talk about another way for me um, because he can do it much better than I can. Um, but in a broad sense, I want to put in a plug for us to all think of ourselves as people who may be vulnerable, struggling, hurting to varying degrees right now and to think about what types of services, supports, connections might be useful. For some people, that may be traditional mental health services. And one of my employers, as I mentioned, is Washington County Mental Health. Um, and they're a resource. I will be, before the end of the meeting, posting their main number they're a resource for everything from general counseling, once a week therapy type services to crisis response. And they do have um, 24 hour, seven days a week, people staffing the crisis response component. So I wanna make sure that I have both of those numbers up and available to you. Um, I want to, in just a few minutes, turn this over to Ken because, um, you know, peer resources are another powerful kind of support right now. Um, and then a number of people will be seeking support if you haven't already from your informal support systems, your family members, your communities, your religious organizations, if that is applicable for you. Um, and so I guess I'm just putting a plug in, you know, people see me and my role as a mental health clinician. And I think the idea sometimes is that I'm going to be talking about a group of people who are having a hard time right now. And I feel like we are, all of us, a group of people who are having a hard time 
right now. So I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I wanted to give Ken an opportunity to speak. And then I wanted to just see if people that are in this meeting have questions, thoughts related to this topic of getting through this time period um, and you know, maintaining hope, maintaining health to the best that we can during challenging times. Um, gonna hand it over to Ken now. <laughs> Thank you, Susan, um, and thank you, Bill, for putting this together, and Chief Pete. Um, so, yeah, for those of you don't who don't know, another way is a community drop-in center at 125 Barry Street. Um, we were rooted in the psychiatric survivor movement, and um, we're about self-determination of care, and we're about trauma-informed responses um, to things that challenge us. Um, we're a safe place. Um, a lot of people come um, and get sanctuary. We have a wonderful greenhouse and wellness room. Right now we're open by appointment, but we are open. Um, and I'll put our numbers in the, in the chat room. And, um, and I, the being trauma informed is, is a wonderful perspective and much needed. And, and I think in our culture, we're not always good at about talking about these things and but I think we're getting better and um, and some of the behavior that was being discussed on the state house lawn is is pretty toxic toxic masculinity or um, uh, other forms of toxicity and um, so it really is heartening um, what a caring um, thoughtful community we have and community meetings like this um, I love hearing Chief Pete's um, outlook and experience and background and commitment to peer work. Um, as Susan mentioned, we are a peer organization um, and we have, you know, uh, folks with uh, mental health challenges, helping other folks with mental health challenges, homeless folks, helping other homeless folks. Um, you know, and we're, it's mutuality. We're, we're helping each other. We're, we're, we're working together um, to address what we, you know, our, our challenges and to live the best life we can possibly live. And it's, it's wonderful to be in Montpelier. So it's, it's a wonderful place to be for this work. So thank you. And I'll just post our numbers in chat. You. Before we go back to Susan, um, that it was about a year ago uh, when the city council was doing their budget that uh, former police chief uh, Tony Fakus uh, proposed funding shared with Barry and with the Washington County Mental Health and State to put the embedded social worker Susan into our department. And so it's a, it's a new initiative of the police department. And even this year with um, severe budget restraints due to COVID, we've retained this because we see it's a very valuable uh, tool in the community. And I think uh, she's sort of defining the job as, as she goes. But uh, anyway, didn't mean to step on your toes, but I thought people would be interested in knowing that. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just open it up to comments, questions about this piece about coping with the times we find ourselves in. I guess that may be a topic so overwhelming that <laughs> when there's maybe not a lot to ask or, or add to it at this point. I, I had a little question that um, to maybe build off of is, is there's also a sort of a COVID mental health line that's run through the state. Is that going to y'all or who's handling that? Because if somebody tries to reach out through there, who are they getting? So, it's not through Washington County Mental Health. I'm going to answer what I believe to be the case um, and emphasizing that it's what I believe to be so because I may mis be mistaken. I believe that that is through the uh, Board of Health or Division of Public Health for Vermont. Um, and I did not think to have that number handy. I will be glad to uh, track it down, provide it, or um, if somebody here has it and would like to share it, that would be fantastic too. 
but you you make a good point that you know COVID has its whole own set of questions, stresses, um, things that we've never had to wonder about or problem solve through before. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Thank you. I've put that information in the chat. Thank you. I just want to say I, I feel like COVID has had some interesting silver linings. Um, it's been interesting to have people's lives be simpler and more down to earth and can't be distracted by, you know, frivolous travel across the world or whatever. <laughs> no, no, but I, there is there is a grounding energy and in, in, in having things slow down and calm down. And, and you know, obviously there's a lot of suffering and, and our hardship and economic impact. Um, but at the same time, on an emotional, interpersonal level, I feel like there's some, been some really interesting positive outcomes. Nice, thank you. Well, not seeing participation on this, and I do, I think Susan's right, this is a pretty personal topic. Um, just know that there are community resources out there, uh, including Washington County Mental Health and Susan herself, and uh, you can always call a, another way is here. Uh, you can call us at the city. We'll try to refer you to the best we can. We're not a social service agency per se, but we can try to get you linked with those that can be. Um, you know, this is a tough time and none of us need to suffer this alone or without help. Um, and so speaking of which, we'll move on to the third topic and Carol will lead us through this, which is basically how do we process ourselves as we are in these con conflict, times of conflict and uh, how can we heal? How can we, you know, have, I mean, this is a really great place for a conversation just like this where people have had uh, different opinions and different questions and we've been able to have a respectful dialogue, which I know personally, I really appreciate. And uh, so Carol, I'll turn it over to you. So, so like I was saying before, um, you know, when, when there's so much um, divisiveness and, you know, we're sitting on different sides of the fence, um, it's natural for us to become positional and adversarial. And, you know, you'll hear people say this, I'm sure you've heard people say this all the time, you know, that you need good listening skills, right? So, um, and that's true. That's really true. And that is also very difficult when it's, when the situation is really emotional. And, and I say that as a trained mediator who, when I'm faced with something that is really emotional, it's difficult for me to be wearing that, that mediator hat and to be rational and, and calm, right? So we all face that. Um, the opportunity for us though, is to be able to take some steps back and, and think about, you know, and prepare ourselves to have, to have a conversation that might be challenging. And there are different ways that you might wanna do that. So if you wanna, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody, you can, you can do things like start to prepare yourself for having that conversation by making notes about what you really want to say, um, what you even, even what you anticipate another person might say back, you know, based on, um, on who you think they are. Um, and oftentimes we're really wrong about that. But there are ways to do that. Um, there's a great book called Difficult Conversations that um, if you want a copy, we could lend you a copy from the Community Justice Center. Um, it's a really good read, but it does help you help guide you through this, this kind of process to figure out, you know, how to ground yourself before you have a challenging conversation. Um, and, then, and then using reflective listening skills, you know, so reflecting back to when you hear somebody say something to you, um, to help them feel heard, you can just basically repeat back what they just told you. So those are some really simple skills that we use a lot in uh, the Community Justice Center. And I, I wanna say too that, you know, in our conversation putting this evening together, it occurred to me that it, it, there might be an opportunity and if people wanted to do this where we could get together um, on a regular basis to talk about, you know, what, what information, um, 
what information we have that we think is really important. And if other people have differing opinions, you know, practice, get together and practice how to listen to each other and to hear things that might be really difficult to hear from someone else. So that's an opportunity. Um, we have a conflict, the conflict assistance program within the Justice Center, which is basically for having mediation or facilitated conversations. And that's a free service. As long as one of the people lives earlier, we offer that. Um, but we can also organize a, a community forum or a community gathering in that way um, to support people in having difficult conversations and practicing those, those types of skills. So that's really all I wanted to share. And I can, I can answer any questions that people have about how that might work. And it really would be up to people in the community to decide if you want to do something like that. They would just need to reach out to us and we could figure out what might be the best, um, the best way to set something up that would serve that purpose. Mr. Stone. Thank you, I'm sorry for uh, taking up a second time to talk. Carol, I appreciate what you just said about the, uh, the idea of listening. I've been very interested for years in the Rural Southern Voice for Peace and their listening projects. And listening projects also go on in the Middle East. Uh, they're based on the idea that you bring people together who may be miles apart in their perspective. The Royal Southern Voice for Peace would simply offer some of the most awful racists an opportunity to be heard, to listen, not to argue, but just to listen. It's worked in the Deep South, it's worked in the Middle East, and it has the effect of softening people's perspectives and humanizing the interactions. Uh, you know, we talk about the, these threatening people. Uh, I don't know who they are. They don't know who I am. And yet, you know, I see them in the grocery store, in the supermarket, and uh, we're at, there's this huge gulf. And uh, if an opportunity presents itself, if we know who these folks are, I would love to see an opportunity for us to, to listen, not to argue, but to hear what they have to say in a nonviolent way without an assault rifle on their shoulder, uh, specifically not to argue, but to, to listen. A protest, a riot, is basically a statement by a person or a group that feels disenfranchised. And if there's some opportunity, uh, I guess I'm addressing this to Carol and to GP, if the opportunity should arise, it would be wonderful for a group of citizens, three or four people, to meet with whoever these threatening folks might be, just to listen, not to argue, not to try to change their minds, but to give them a chance to feel heard. Because what happened in, in Washington, in, in, in any protest, is a statement saying, we haven't been heard. We need to raise our voices a little bit. So I would suggest that you Take a look at online about the uh, the listening projects in the Deep South and in the Middle East, and it's been used in other places with great success. It's a low key, gentle sort of approach to reconciliation. Um, if the opportunity should present itself, I would love to participate in something like that, and I bet others would too. Thank you, Jacob. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, that's. That's and that's you know sometimes what's really difficult to us is to listen and not respond, mm -hmm. and um, you know when when I'm talking about reflecting skills, you know using reflecting skills, that is really just you know helping somebody understood that that you've heard what they have to say. So yeah, I appreciate that. I will I will look into that for sure. It's harder yeah. to be violent towards somebody yeah. that you've met and chatted with. Well, and I'll just say that in the restorative process also what, you know, what we, what we do is we, to, you know, creating this greater understanding when people are listening to each other, it really does de-escalate and diffuse lots of the emotion and, and anger that, that people might feel about um, having been harmed in some way. And, 
you know, when you when you think about it, when somebody comes to you and it issues a, a sincere apology, and you have a better understanding of what their motivation was, or that they do see you as a human being and see you in a different way, and and are remorseful about about what they might have done or said, you know, we all soften and we say, you know, then you, then you, that's the the beginning of the healing process, and and that's an opportunity to start um, start forgiveness. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the beauty of what happens in the restorative pro process often when we have the person who's been affected and the responsible person in the same room. But if, if the opportunity should be there for us to talk to these folks, whoever they may be, or to listen to them, I think that could have a great benefit for the community. Thanks, Mary's been trying to get in for a little oh, bit. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you so much for hosting this discussion. Um, I agree with what um, Jacob said. However, I would add, I would add something. Um, I think listening, deep listening is a lot harder um, to practice in a climate of a lot of hate and fear. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these folks who've contested the election, the ex-president supporters, I think there's a strong undercurrent of white bodied supremacy. So I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any answer, but um, clearly the, the country is, is very broken and we're very fortunate to live in a community that it appears does not embrace hate, does not tolerate it. But I, I do think that that element of hatred it, 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 can, it can make it much more difficult to listen from a, a place of any depth. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mary. Anybody else like to weigh in on the general topic of healing, listening, community or national divisions? Mary, I just wanna follow up on that and say that uh, we had some initial conversation um, two weeks ago um, at the city uh, about hosting something like this or some other opportunity for people from either side to get together. And my initial thinking was that, you know, things really do need to de-escalate to some degree before we try to, to bring people together just because we want it, we want it to be an effective, an effective process and we want it to be a safe space for people. So um, I, I appreciate your words, and I think that that um, as time goes on, that we might be in a better place to do something like that. And it, you know, it's and it would be a voluntary. It would be voluntary. So having people willing to come together is another another aspect of it. Like, how do you invite people to the table and help everyone feel safe and welcome? I see Barbara's hand up. Yeah. Um, I read recently an article in Scientific American by <clears throat> a forensic psychiatrist. I said, what do they do? <laughs> but they deal with people that are like narcissists and um, his analysis that these people that are really the ones like Storm the Capital are cultists and they've really gotten into that mentality and it's very, very difficult to deal with somebody. You cannot argue with him. And uh, he basically says the best thing is to get the, the ones that are causing, that are stirring things up out of the way so that the people can come down and start to return to normal. And so I think that's kind of the way that I'm feeling right now because I have, in the 60s, I was in Memphis, Tennessee. Let's just leave it at that. Um, You can't reason with somebody who's spitting hate. They have to be, they have to come down and they don't want to listen. <laughs> Sometimes they want to knock your head off. Um, so um, it's okay from our side, I understand, deep listening. But the question is, the person on the other side has to be in a space where they can not only talk, but also listen and I think 
that's the thing that we're in the, the problem that we have right now is that it's um if you're dealing with cultists and people that have been abused which is basically the other thing he says that they're in an abusive relationship too so um so i'll just weigh yeah, in on that <laughs> thank you for that barbara and i'm just going to weigh in um based on observations and uh, my own personal experiences in this job for a period of time but also paying attention to this and that is mm -hmm. um I think people on both sides feel that. And there are those who feel very strongly on the left who sometimes don't listen and are, get caught up in their righteousness and uh, get preachy. And I think that causes a pushback from others who say that you know, they don't care, they're just a bunch of liberal cultists or whatever. So I think it's, it's um, and, and obviously we've seen this recently with the far right taking over the capital and those kinds of things. I think it's important that we understand that we don't get so entrenched in our position and our, our righteousness, no matter where we fall in the political spectrum or whatever spectrum it might be. It could be, you know, Beatles versus Stones for, for all I know. But, um, it, you know, is to understand why someone feels the way they do and to listen and to, to you know, hear them out and try to, try to, that's the only way we'll go forward. And I think sometimes it's easy to think, I believe this, I'm right, these people are wrong and therefore we've got to fix them. And because they feel that way about you too, so. Ken, do you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I grew up in, in Brandon, Vermont and a lot of the people I grew up with Probably uh, would uh, be, uh, feel strong affinity with the folks on State House lawn, and um, I, I I appreciate what Bill just said because I, I, it's, it really is a practice to try to not be us versus them about things. Um, I mean, yes, you can you can identify cult thinking, you can identify racism, for sure, but if I'm able to see folks being passionate in the in the streets of our cities and understand that the you know that that's the language of being unheard I, I hear the folks I grew up with feeling unheard and feeling left behind and so I just I, I, I think it, it is a deep practice to to listen and I mean both holding people accountable to standards of behavior and no it's not okay to do what they did to the capital or or to to Olivia's daughter um, but at, at the same time, having compassion for the very real suffering that folks are feeling. So that's all. I see a Pat Hoffman. Barbara, is your hand still up or have you just not put it down? <laughs> Pat. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, about the polarized positions, when you're listening to people, um, you're listening for more than their positions. You know, um, when I lived in Durham, North Carolina, there used to be a panel that um, was talking about racism and they invited C.P. Ellis, who was the grand wizard of the KKK, and Ann Atwater, who was a, uh, an African-American um, activist, and they sat on this panel and and talked and over the time and they traveled together to talk about these issues and eventually they realized that apart from whatever their you know talking points were about their positions they had a lot in common as people and they had a similar economic background and struggles in their families and they became friends and um, C.P. Ellis gave the um, eulogy, I think, at, her, at Ann Atwater's funeral. So it had to do with um, who they were. They found out who they were as people. And when we're listening to people in, uh, in a restorative justice process, we're not asking them about their position on some you know, political, some policy. We're, we're hearing about them as people. And that's why I'm a lot more hopeful maybe than other people about how we can end up talking to each other. I think it, it 
we, we're not going to be talking about these insoluble differences. We're going to be talking about commonalities. And we're also talking about behaviors too. In a restorative process, you know, we're, we're incident, we, we like to say it's incident focused. So we're, you know, we, we narrow down what the conversation is about and it's about actions and behaviors and decisions as opposed to, you know, really big picture kind of, kind of uh, conversation. So thank you for that, Pat. Carol, there's a question in the chat uh, directed. I don't know if you can see it or if you'd like me to read it. Um, yeah, I did read it. Um, so, so this the question is with regard to um, restorative justice with a child and adult in the conversation um, with regard to the safety, attention and safety of the child, um, noting that, um, that an event can be traumatic for a child or an adult for that matter. Um, the, the way we do the process is we would, we begin by doing an intake meeting with each party. So um, Pat Hoffman actually is our victim services specialist. So she would be calling the person who was affected during the incident. And then Erin Anderson, who was here earlier, she is our restorative programs coordinator. She would be calling the responsible party and having conversation about what the process looks like and uh, basically doing some in education about restorative process and what their role is going to look like while they're and and if they choose to be in the room together, then um, you know we give choice to the person who's been affected whether or not they want to participate in person in a, in a panel process. So it starts with the intake and helping them understand what it's going to look like. Um, an affected party also can have Pat um, either represent them at the panel meeting or go to the panel meeting with them to offer them support, just to be a, a support person. Anybody who attends a panel meeting is welcome to have somebody there for support. So it doesn't necessarily address <clears throat> what might be inherent <clears throat> power imbalance, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> between an adult <clears throat> and a child. Um, <clears throat> but we do our best to follow excuse me, follow a process. <clears throat> and in this process, give me a second. <laughs> I know Carol's been in Zoom meetings all day, so. I have. <clears throat> so in this process, you know, we're asking specific questions, like I said, about the incident and about <clears throat> the impact. So we're really trying to level the playing field. We don't want there to be power imbalances. And if we see something like that happening, there's always a supervisor, meaning a staff person at the meeting. So either I am at the meeting or Aaron is at the meeting. And we watch for things like that to make sure that there isn't any um, re-victimization or any bullying or anything like that. And we would stop that really quickly if something like that happened. So we are sensitive to um, all of the issues and, and concerns that people bring to the table. And, Pat is really good at fleshing that, that out with folks and helping them feel prepared and feel safe to be able to participate in the restorative process. So I don't know if, if, if that doesn't answer the question, you have a follow-up question around that, I'm happy to answer it. Thank you, Carol. I'll just note, we are very fortunate to have our Community Justice Center team here in Montpelier. They've, um, they've been a leader in the state in these types of practices for many years now and uh, are a real asset to the city. And I think um, I think the police department would agree that they've been a, a big help for support for them as well. Uh, any other questions, comments on this topic? If so, I think we bring it to wrap up. Uh, one person that has been with us uh, the whole time and had asked not to be singled out, but I'm going to put her on the spot now, is Mayor Ann Watson. Uh, didn't know if you wanted to offer any closing thoughts. Well, sure, thanks. Um, <laughs> I have uh, really appreciated all the, the thoughts and comments that you all brought to this um, meeting. I think this was really valuable. I'm, I'm uh, so grateful that uh, I mean, this, this was not my idea. And, and um, I, 
I, I'm not sure who I get to, to thank for this, um, for this meeting, but um, I think it was really valuable and um, maybe worth doing again sometime. Um, I mean, let's hope that we're not processing um, the incredibly difficult events as we have been um, recently, but, but I, I, again, I think this was, this was really valuable and I, I appreciate um, the time everyone took to, um, to, to bring your thoughts and also to, um, to do some reflecting together on this. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before I circle back to the, uh, the three main speakers, does anybody else have any sort of final thoughts they want to offer? Any members of the audience or group? I guess audience isn't the right word, is it? The group. Okay, well then, uh, Susan, do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to offer? Um, you don't have to. Oops. <laughs> okay, Carol, would you like to offer anything? Susan, were you muted or were you offering? Can, am I unmuted now? <laughs> yeah, you're unmuted now. Um, only to echo what Anne and others said that I think this is really valuable and um, I also appreciate being um, invited and allowed to be part of this conversation and part of the community. So thank you. Carol, any pearls? Sure, I just want to, I just want to say that, um, you know, we are um, always available for a phone call or an email. Um, if you wanna talk about our conflict assistance program or any other ways that we can be of assistance in helping you learn how to have, a, have you know, conversations in conflict or um, you know, any questions that you have about restorative process and the work that we do, we're, we're always available. Um, so feel free to get in touch with us. I will leave my cell phone number in the chat and um, you can call anytime. Chief Pete, would you like to say anything? Uh, well, just to, to say to wish everybody good evening and uh, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with with our community members tonight. And um, we uh, we're very fortunate to be in, in a city that that's very uh, just engaged into what the community uh, to the needs and the desires of our community. So we're we're very grateful to be here. And we're very honored and privileged to to serve our our city. Thank you. Well, I'm very glad you're here, Chief Pete. Um, so I guess I'll wrap it up and just say thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, this really has been an honor to participate in. I, you know, I am tend to be more of a worker bee type and not a, you know, let's all share our feelings. And had I'm honest with you, I was a little bit like, mm, how's this going to go? And I really, I really appreciated that everybody um, spoke from the heart and spoke directly. Uh, I got a huge amount out of it. So thank you and uh, thank you to our team that. Uh, Carol and Brian, really, the ones that pushed for doing this, and Cameron. Uh, so um, certainly wasn't me. Uh, but I'm glad we did it. And I, I'm glad you all came out. And I hope we answered your questions. And I hope um, if you have unanswered questions and you'd like to follow up with any of us offline, we're, we're of course, here for you. So thanks. And with that, I um, hope everybody has a great rest of their evening. Good night, everyone.